Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Empower Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk with people in the industry about uh, best practices for getting in. Um, our core audience are people who are maybe new to the industry, maybe in college. Um, and basically, Steve and I have noticed certain pitfalls or certain mistakes that people have made in the beginnings of their careers, and we'd like to kind of address those so people don't make the same mistakes that we did. Um, my name is Byron. Um, I'm a software engineer at Encore. And uh, we also have Steve Meehan, who is a recruiter at Onward Play. And today we have a special guest, uh, Chell Wong. Uh, now, Chell's actually a professional composer, and this is really awesome for me. This was actually what I first wanted to do when I got into the industry. So I'm going to have a lot of questions for her when we get into this. Um, yeah, Chell, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and give a little bit of your background? Sure, yeah. So uh, my name is Chell. Uh, I'm an award-winning composer. I worked on Kine and Only Cans. I'm currently writing music for Whisker Squadron and doing sound design for She Dreams Elsewhere. Uh, I also do, I guess, consulting and mentoring, and I help teach people how to have a uh, successful freelance career in game audio. Uh, and I used to run Game Audio Boston, but I'm actually, this is like my last month, so I'm stepping down from that and... Uh, I need to find help for the charity album that I run every year. Awesome. Awesome. And um, so we talked about this briefly before we started the podcast, but uh, what's your background in music? Um, how did you get started? And um, like, did you play a lot of games growing up? <laughs> so I definitely played a lot of games growing up. Um, I feel like a lot of the people that I used to play games with don't anymore, which is kind of a bummer. But uh, I grew up playing a lot of games and I still do. Uh, and as for music, I did some piano like when I was like in first grade and then fell off. But uh, from fourth grade onward, I was pretty good at trombone. And I actually went to college at Ithaca to be a band teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I failed. So that led to some interesting turn of events where I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do for the first time since I was like 13. Because I was like, I was pretty sure I was going to do music, but I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And I almost went to grad school for bass trombone performance and then i i found someone who needed video game music so i had never really composed anything before that but i i asked them to, if i could just take a shot and they had nothing to lose because they were just two people making a game for fun mm -hmm. and so they're like sure and then i just kept running music for them and then from there i'm like well it's either that or go to grad school and so i figured i'd, I'd double down and, and try and make it work and here I am today. Awesome. And um, so kind of what, what was your experience on like those first games? Because I know for me personally, I've done some music for games as well in the past. And um, like everyone tells you, oh, use F mod or use Ys. But then like, how do you actually do it? So can you, like, what was your experience in the beginning or what were some of the thoughts that you had when you first like had those first few gigs? So I've actually never used F mod or Ys yet. Um, I feel like those are uh, really helpful for like much bigger projects. But uh, the early projects I've done were like very small. Uh, the very first game I worked on, it, it never reached, a, it never launched yet. I think they're still kind of tinkering around with it. Uh, but it was in like a, a pretty unusual engine. And I mostly just wrote music and then sent them the, the, the files, like the WAV files. Uh, and I also was trying to do sound design and my sound design back then was like really garbage. Mm. Um, I think that my composing actually was still, uh, I had a pretty good ear for things, but I've learned a lot since then. And back in the day, uh, cause I came from a more classical background. I wrote everything in finale, which I hate. Also, am I allowed to curse? Cause I had to not curse in that moment. Cause that's, that's fine. All right. I fucking hate finale. <laughs> so, uh, I would just export the 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 terrible garatan instruments and uh i later learned what a daw was which is a di digital audio workstation where people do all of their audio work in mm -hmm. but i i didn't even know what that was when i first started and so i i was just trawling in like the oc remix forums because I, I didn't know where else to go and and they're like what daw do you use i'm like i don't know what that is <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that was uh, that was like me in the early days and and then i I learned that if I wanted to find work in the games industry, I needed to network. And because I'm in Boston, there are like five to six meetups every month. And I would basically go to all of them every time. 
And so for like five straight months of that, I, I finally found my first gig, uh, which it's it's like an early access now, I think. It's called Chibi Sue's Costume Combat. Uh, but my work on that is still not done. So just to give you an idea of like how game development can be sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have something we're about to say, something, Steve? Or... Yeah, I was going to say, like, can you take us back into your journey into gaming? Because I know everybody has such an interesting background. <clears throat> and obviously you are a, a music enthusiast. Obviously you're a game enthusiast. Can you tell us how you got, like, how did you figure out that you yourself wanted to marry both of these two worlds of gaming and music and turn it into a profession? Well, my whole life, people knew that I was really into video games and people knew I was good at music and I eventually was planning on making a career out of it. I actually originally didn't want to work in games because I thought if I did, I would lose my passion for it. I'd I'd be uh, disillusioned and whatever. Uh, and yeah, obviously there are certain things that like, okay, it's work and yeah, the games industry is kind of whack, but <laughs> I definitely still love everything about it. Um, but I pretty much, I didn't think that I could or should until I kind of had really nothing else to fall back on. I, I tried to be an, a music educator and that didn't work out. And then I just tried to do more education stuff and I burned out super hard and it was awful. <laughs> so then I was... I was lost. Uh, and so since people were telling me my whole life to give it a shot, I, I figured I would. And so I've just been busting my ass, just networking and, and making content and writing music and, and all that. So it was one of those things that because everything else fell apart, I I said, fuck it, let's give it a go. <laughs> right on. I love that. And like that it's so interesting to hear people's journeys because you had an idea that you wanted to work in gaming, but you kind of talked yourself out to, uh, out of it. And then you had others that were kind of like, Hey, you know, it, it kind of makes sense for you to get into the industry. So maybe you should give it a shot. Um, and then I know that there are tons of other people that are struggling with that own internal, like, should I do what I'm passionate about? Should I do what I'm good at? Um, and it seems like that you are, you have a good sense of where you're moving career wise mm-hmm. and like I, I, what type of insights would you provide to anybody that's kind of in that same mindset where they're figuring out like what they want to do as a profession so i've talked to a lot of people about this for various things some of them are game audio people some of them are not uh i feel like there's a couple ways to approach life where you can you can do work that you're comfortable with that you're good at and that provides for you something that's stable and and you can do and it might not be your favorite thing ever but if it's if you're happy enough doing it that's definitely like a way to do it and support yourself and you'll still have uh you can still make time in your life for like the things that you love and care about um you can also try and do your you can try and make your passion your career and if your passion is something that's like game audio you want to write music for video games it's a really I love my job. I really do. But it's really hard work. It's really hard to get into. And I do honestly believe that it is possible to succeed. But you have to bust your ass to get your foot in the door, it feels like. And even once you get at least a little bit of work, it's definitely a climb to do game audio and make it sustainable. And a lot of people, basically everyone actually, has to have other jobs at the same time as game audio and and then at some point make game audio make enough money so that they can pivot to that being their main job and cut back on the side job or well, what would then be the side job um so it's it's certainly possible i definitely think it's it's a matter of like what do you want in life because if you want something to be consistent safe uh easier <laughs> uh sometimes things like this like game audio is not it's not very consistent there are very few in-house like jobs there are very few non-contract jobs where you're actually just an employee um and if you're like a programmer like programmers can make so much more money out of games than they do in games and so what you're willing to like work on and have as that that that's that's really tricky and that's up to you to decide for yourself 
But if you want it bad enough, you can make it work. It's just you need to learn the, the business skills and be able to be self-sustaining and learn all of the soft skills necessary. And and and, and a lot of it is luck. It's a ton of luck. Understood. And like, can we can we kind of double click on some of those topics there? Like, I know you mentioned like you have to bust your ass in order to get into the industry and you need to build skills like the soft skills and the technical skills. Like if what are some of those skills for people that are just like, I don't know what to do now. What are the actual like hard skills and soft skills that I need to learn? Like, what does that mean to you? So the hard skills are are just like your audio stuff. Like you got to do you got to learn how to. If, all right. So there's there's many things in game audio. But if you're a composer like me, you you got to learn how to write music, um, theoretically mix it um, early days, mastering it. Just a lot of stuff of a sense of orchestration. I'm going to be honest. I never learned any of this. I didn't learn any of this. Not really. At least I, I took like a very small songwriting class in high school and uh that that was that was so long ago and and very little of that i use i mostly just go by intuition and like i have theory knowledge because i went i was going to be a band teacher so i had to know a lot of this stuff and how instruments work and so i have some stuff but i actually don't even write with real instruments that much i honestly just think that the more you do the easier certain things will come the more you learn as long as you're willing to to put the work into learning it um like i learned sound design as I went and just searched a lot of YouTube videos, just a ton of them. Um, but in my opinion, the more important thing is the the soft skills, um, managing your finances, learning how to budget stuff, uh, meeting people, uh, just networking, not selling. I've seen my business cards on the floor. Like we've all, <laughs> a lot of us have been there. Um, and just and how to how to build relationships. Being patient enough for those relationships that pay off, how to make people like you. Like I have done so much networking that I I feel like to an extent I have in a sense studied making friends. I've learned <laughs> how all these people from all sorts of walks of life, from different parts of the world, um, they're all different and they all have different ideas and they come from different things. And we're all passionate about games. Uh, but because everyone's so different, I've like kind of learned like how do I make friends with people? And like, I, I still am very much myself. I definitely am far from in from far from inauthentic. But uh, it's I think the most important things are the the technical side of the business things, like money and all of that freelancing business stuff, and and the soft stuff like making friends and networking and and getting yourself out there. And I actually have a lot of videos out there on my YouTube channel that are specifically designed to teach people like this, as well as my newsletter. Can you go into, like, what are some of the specifics that you talk about in the uh, in your YouTube content, in your newsletter? Because I agree that networking is such a huge aspect. It's not just about the technical skills, but how do you get people to actually want to work with you? Um, can you take a, a deep dive and, like, for the content that you created, how did you come about this stuff and how are you approaching your uh, your material? I would say that a lot of stuff I've learned from like studying and I've I've had a mentor. His name is Akash the Car. He's great. Ah, cool. um, but also he's great. And I have a lot of other friends who have put out great content and I like to read all their takes and ideas on things. And since I do so much networking like a lot of this is learned a lot of this is stuff that i come up with and i don't agree with i don't 100 percent agree with everyone or anyone for anything um but there's a lot of like really fantastic idea uh, ideas and stuff and my my content might not be 100 percent useful for everyone but i hope it's at least a a good chunk helpful for a lot of people um but i've i've developed a lot of mentality and ideas through uh, a stupid amount of networking so I, I guess for me, because I'm such an extreme extrovert um, and I just really love friendship, I I just go out of my way to try and make friends with people. And I'm not going to be like best friends with everyone, but I try to have like a real a real connection with people and and how we and connect on things. And also, um, I think it's really easy to fall into the trap that like when you meet someone, you want to get like this business connection like right away. Uh, 
life doesn't work that way and friendships are not transactional uh as i always tell people 99 percent of the people i meet i will never work with and that's mm-hmm. fine people have been really great to me in many different ways and i am really happy to be their friends and i like to try and support them in my own way so i would say that it's it's just about meeting people and being consistent and being someone in your community whichever community that is i always like to recommend starting at your local community there's usually an online presence for it too um but just being a presence in your community and getting to know people uh that is the easiest way to really get started it just takes a lot of time Mm -hmm. yeah and that's such a huge part of just building connections with people um because one of the things that we we've discussed before is it's not just who you know but it's who knows you right Mm -hmm. that's how a lot of those opportunities come into play can you talk about what are some of the opportunities that you've gotten just through networking and what was how how did the dominoes all kind of fall into place so that you got uh some amazing opportunities that that came your way every project i have except for the newest one which i'm not allowed to talk about i have gotten because i met them and we talked and over time we built up stuff uh my first few projects i will say i got lucky uh, my very first contract, I was like pretty disheartened. I would go to meet up and meet up and meet up and I'd be exhausted because I'd be there for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I got lucky and I found someone who was willing to like hire me more or less on the spot. That's super rare. Um, typically, I would have uh, in, in most other cases, I have some level of correspondence that like goes back and forth. And then we learn more about the project. And then like, I still learn about the project, uh, but I established a contract with him. And thankfully, that contract led me to establish the fact that I was a professional getting paid to do what I do. And uh, and then I met Gwen Frey, who made Kine. And I, I was lucky enough to be exactly who she was looking for at the time. She wanted to find someone who's kind of up and coming and new. And I like jazz and I play trombone. And cool. it was like, I also love puzzle games. And so it was just like this perfect match. And uh, she took a chance on me. And I'm still forever thankful for her. Uh, but since then, like, I've just been everywhere all the time and when people need audio even though my friends aren't necessarily hiring they usually refer me to to whoever they know because i'm the first person they think about um because i'm such an (laughs) i'm such an omnipresence in wherever circle they're in (laughs) just constantly there and i have made an effort to be the first person that people think about um and so only in the most recent case has that ever really kind of panned out in the sense that like uh, a former client of mine put my name forward to a new client who was looking to hire a composer and their former composer was not yet available for this project. And that's like the only time that that's ever been like, hey, like someone put your name forward and that worked out because usually it's I have gone to know someone over a significant portion of time and then they're like, hey, you know, we could use someone. And then I'd be like, oh, is that so, huh? <laughs> and then uh, I'm like, well, maybe we should talk about stuff. Gotcha. And it sounds like that you, when it comes to networking, that it's not just quantity of relationships and people that you connect with, but it's also quality of how genuine you are with those connections. Like saying that um, it's not just transactional where I'm going to do something for you if you do something for me. Um, but you're genuinely like getting to know people. And it, it at least to me, it's that's what it sounds like. Um, is is that accurate? Like you? Oh, yeah, get to for know sure. People? Yeah, like the quantity of how I, I do so much networking. And there are, there are some people that I see like very frequently and I'm like not as close as with other people. And that's just maybe chemistry or whatever. Or sometimes people are annoying or whatever. But um, I definitely like to think of myself as like, I'm homies with people. Yeah. I want to be friends with people. And and then friends ask friends for favors and help and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I, I know someone who needs something. I'm like, oh, who's my first friend that I know that like, oh, you, you have like, uh, I just had someone just tell me like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to find like uh, a job in rigging. I'm like, oh, if I ever think if I ever meet someone that needs someone that needs uh, animation rigging, you I could like put your name for it. And uh, there are a lot of people like, oh, I'm trying to find community management and like every time they were trying to the, a, a job app came up, I would like tag them or send it to them or whatever. And I, I like actively go out of my way to try and support friends because like I care about them. So 
yeah, it's it's not just like the whole like nice guy syndrome where you're just like, oh, you're nice to someone and then you like expect something in return. Like things don't work that way. Uh, I just want to be there for people and um, should opportunities come this way, like I can shift into business mode and we can talk about stuff and the project and numbers and all that stuff. But like first and foremost, it's just I try and make friends. So yeah, I, uh, I, I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I actually watched your video on networking. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, I really enjoyed it. Can you kind of go into some of the don'ts or some of the some of the things that maybe you shouldn't be doing when you're approaching someone for the first time? Because um, I found some of your examples to be pretty funny. <laughs> I'm pretty sure in, in that video, if not that one, another one, I, I, I go into not selling because, holy crap, I have I have been in situations where... I have seen, I met someone, I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, you know, hi, nice to meet you. And then they're like, my name's Blah. And I tell them my name and he tells me what he does. And I tell him what I do. And he just goes, we're running like this, this VR meetup on blah, blah, blah. would love for you to come. Just puts a card in my hand. And I'm just like, okay. And I just take the card. And it's like, all right, nice meeting you. Immediately turns 180, starts talking to my friend behind him. And I was just like, wow. Okay there, buddy. Uh, I don't remember who that is. I don't remember what his meetup was. <laughs> I don't do VR, really. And so it was a, a whole amalgamation of like, wow, do not do this. Uh, he sold his, he, he sold his, the whatever he was trying to do. Um, he had no care into what I did. He, I was just a person he was just trying to scoop up and, and quantitize the entire meetup. So he had, he didn't care about me at all. He didn't care about what I do. It was it was very very shallow of like oh cool also blah and so that that didn't mean it. And also I never saw him again. And so like some people I've met I've met thousands of people maybe over one thousand I can I can comfortably say whether it's multiple thousands I don't know but I've met a lot of freaking people and some people I've only met once. And sometimes they, they say hi. And I'm going to be honest, I don't remember every single person. I only have two brain cells and I <laughs> can only hold so much information. And so uh, there have been some people who, who said hi to me and I can't remember because maybe we had a very small conversation at uh, in one of many, many places that I go to or have been. And sometimes people can get a little salty and like that's uncomfortable. So if you want people to remember you, you got to be consistent and also maybe follow up and be present online and, and make the connections or also be like, hey, great meeting you at this location at this time and whatever. And we talked about X and that's like a really great way to cement like, oh, yeah, I remember you better now. And even if I don't, I can at least like find our conversation and refer to it and, and then it can spark a memory. Uh, but like those are like some of the big obvious ones of like people are really, really, really aggressive and trying to like quote unquote get business married with people who are not on the market <laughs> and uh also expecting more from other people than they necessarily put out to to get um so i think those are like kind of the really big no-nos and also like if you put like i'm a freelancer and a lot of freelancing advice is similar to dating advice so like if you're a freelancer you tend to know of like hey don't be that creepy guy, you know, like, yeah, don't don't do these things. And if you think about it that way, you're like, oh, yeah, that that does kind of suck, doesn't it? So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I loved your example. Um, um, I think it was a networking video where someone reached out to a developer you're working with saying, hey, do you need music? <laughs> and you literally had a screenshot of the dude being like, How, what, what is this guy doing? You're literally in the credits for this and are still trying to see if they can do music for this game. <laughs> There's so many people who do no research. <laughs> do your research. Oh my god. It's not that hard. Sometimes it is hard. I get it. But That one was easy. For a lot of cases, they're not. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, please, do do a minimum amount of research of like try and find if X game has a composer before you ask them if they need a composer. And I do remember there was one person who, who emailed the developer and said, hi, uh, blah, 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 like the game. Um, I do this specific. They're like, 
asking if they could do like a like a sung theme song and they acknowledged that i was on the project and they were like maybe something about getting put getting connected to me or if like if i need that uh if he he would be interested in helping and that at least i can respect of like okay mm-hmm. like you did the research you know i'm on the project um i don't remember who it was but like the client like my my client told me about it and I don't necessarily know if I have any intentions of doing that, but I at least can respect that this is the idea that they have and like this is why they thought they were a good fit for the project. Um, so at least that I can I can understand, but some people just you, you just like pop out of the bushes like, hey, you need a composer? And like, no, <laughs> who are you? Hello? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty it's it's a pretty interesting kind of thing. Like, um, I do some music. I'm mostly a programmer now. And I remember at one point posting an Instagram, uh, putting a post on Instagram of like a thing I was working on. And I specifically said that I wrote the music in it. And then someone reached out to me and said, hey, if you ever need music for this, let me know. And I was just like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And I, I like understanding the networking aspect and how important it is to uh just to make these genuine connections it sounds like you're a like a professional networker and i know there are tons of like little tips and tricks that you use to help keep track of the conversations um with with people like i know one of the tricks that i use is like if i meet somebody in person i do my best to take a selfie with them (laughs) so that i remember like a time and a place where we met and I have some notes in my phone um, that's like, okay, we met at this meetup, and these are some of the things that we discussed. I'm sure you've picked up tons of tricks on the uh, along the way. What are some things that you would advise for others to kind of keep track of the multitudes of people that you come across? So I like the selfie idea. It's not necessarily something I do, but if I do take a selfie with someone, then I must have had a good conversation with them, and I usually remember all the people in the selfies that I'm with. Um, so. I love business cards. I unironically love business cards. And I know that some people have like there's there's some baggage of like it being very like corporate or whatever the heck. Um, but I want to collect people's business cards. Um, a lot of people write notes of where they met and how. And so it's nice to have an amount of blank space. Sometimes people just have a completely blank backside. Um, I have stuff on both sides, but I, I have enough white space that you can write stuff on. Um, but I also digitize business cards, so I take a picture, and I use this app called CamCard, and I swear to goodness they should sponsor me because I shill for them so hard every time. <laughs> and CamCard is like a human Pokedex where you just take Ooh. pictures of people's business cards, and you can tag them as like, oh, here are programmers, I'm, and, and here are all the people I met at PAX East, and here are all the people that are from Sweden or whatever. Um, if I really wanted to do a tag, I don't think I've met enough Swedish people. I usually just remember them. Um but the point is, is that that's a really helpful way of remembering. Um, following up with people, if you like enough, if you like a conversation enough, you follow up the next day and just be like, hi, it was great meeting you at this event. And we talked about this thing. Uh, hope to see you around more, blah, blah, blah. Keep in touch. Something along the lines of that to establish like, a more connection, because certainly there are people that I've met and I just there's so many things I do in a single day when I'm at a conference. Um at this point also, oh, well, this is actually important too. Having a CRM or a client relationship manager for people who are legitimately possibly interested in work or there's some sort of thing that you want to follow up on, uh, keep track of who that is and also follow up still. And you put that in in your database, uh, whatever. There are so many different client relationship managers, so Google it, I guess. Um, but I, I use mine to keep track of like possible leads, some of them are dead leads. Some of them have resulted in things. I also keep track of my old clients too, which is a really helpful way of like keeping business relationships and, and just like once a year if, if you want to or like once every six months, sometimes just messaging an old client, just be like, hey, how is everything going? Like, hope you've been well. I, I see you're, you're doing blah, 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 blah. And just, just trying to keep cordial with people. Um, But also, I guess, just me personally, since I've been doing this so long and so much, I have gotten to the point where, especially because of online networking, I don't have business cards to keep hold of. I am everywhere all the time <laughs> to the point where it, maybe I need to slow down. But uh, I think that partially it's other people's responsibilities to keep up with me if they want something from me. Uh, and again, if I if I think someone is particularly interesting or I think that there's a possible, possible chance of being uh, in business with each other, I will certainly put them in my client relationship manager and and keep and keep a track of them keep an eye on them 
and sometimes things happen sometimes things don't but relationships are two ways so keep the onus on yourself but also if other people don't necessarily reciprocate that's okay too and you mentioned uh, crms and you mentioned different platforms i i know that i connected with you on linkedin and um what are the other platforms that you use for networking because there's so many of them out there there's all types of social media there's discord there's facebook twitter instagram which ones do you use i am on twitter the most um i used to be on facebook the most when i was younger um but twitter is really easy i think possibly because i can just shit post and and I, my goal on Twitter was to be able to shitpost and not lose followers, and I think <laughs> I've reached that goal now. Um, but it's it's pretty easy because most people in game dev are connected through there, um, and it's it's nice to see how people talk and interact with each other. Um, I just think that's easy because I can just say something stupid on the internet and it'll just go out there. Um, I'm on Instagram, but Instagram takes a lot more work. Some people like that because it gatekeeps terrible people out. Um, I personally think it just feels like everything is a lot more like rigid. And Instagram is like the most user hostile app I've ever used. It just doesn't want you to use it um, or it only forces you to use it in one way. And it's annoying. Uh, I'm on Facebook, but I, that's mostly if we're like actually friends. And and LinkedIn is like the most like clean presence that I have where it's like no shit posting, only professional stuff. And sometimes the professional stuff can be a little bit like jokey or whatever. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty clean. I would and discords are like. A community thing sometimes i connect with people through a discord server and then i talk to them over dms that way uh but i don't usually just give my discord information out to just anyone and everyone it's like all right if we're in a mutual server like we can connect that way sure um but like i i'm personally just everywhere but not everyone needs to be i i recommend at least focusing on like one maybe two mm -hmm. and being open to others but like some people hate linkedin and that's fine <laughs> Some people love it, and that's fine. Uh, you're just going to have different relationships and connections through those places. And I know so, and I know that you're using uh, these different platforms for different reasons. As a recruiter, I particularly like LinkedIn because it gives me an opportunity to kind of use it as my Google search, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm looking for a composer that lives in the LA area, has three years of experience, and is good with um, fmod and adobe for some reason i can put literally put all of that stuff into a search and it'll bring up a list whereas opposed to like facebook or twitter i can't see that um mm -hmm. if i'm looking to fill a position um where what platforms have you gotten like the most business benefit from it um is it is it social media or is it literally the face-to-face -face conversations where you're going to like conferences Face to face, honestly, that's for me, at least. And again, not everything is the same for everyone. Like recruiters love LinkedIn and I understand why. And now I have an even better understanding as to why um, I use LinkedIn as a way to keep in touch with people that I've met. Um, I've done a ton of networking over Zoom or in Discord servers where people have like set meetups and there's like and sometimes people turn on their cameras. I like to be able to see other people's faces and and have an a pretty regular amount of, of when I can see them. Um, I do the Zoom networking group. It used to be every week. Now it's once a month. And I was like lamenting how I'm like, man, I used to see my friends every week. And now I see them 12 times a year. And that makes me sad. Mm. But uh, just the the sheer quality of the people I've met there, just because they're great, but also like they're very experienced and there's a diverse people, a diverse group of people there. Um, and how frequent I could do it. Um, besides that, though, like, meeting people at PAX and, and trying to connect with people that maybe I've met on the internet that way or or at GDC and, and just or sometimes just some people I know are like very into planning and they they seek out specific people that they want to meet and connect with. And that's mm -hmm. like really helpful, especially, you know, I'm trying to find a publisher and I have a publisher meeting with someone. Uh, sometimes I just wing it and I'm just like, I'm going to hang out in the gardens and just talk to whoever like they seem cool. Random conversation strikes up. Who knows? Sometimes things sometimes I keep in touch with people. There are people I met like once in person and then i keep in touch with them online and certainly a lot of people i like i have no memory of mm -hmm. anything <clears throat> like i have their card i don't remember anything else so, so okay. uh, i've kind of just done a lot of winging it with uh just the sheer amount of things and seeing where the dominoes fall in place because of how 
I've kind of just done a lot and I've <laughs> just done so much. So who actually sticks around is, is a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you mentioned like a lot of face-to-face -face meetups um, and I'm sure that like, that's an entire uh, subject matter that we can go into. Um, I know one of my tricks for meeting people at conferences is to go to like the hotels that are close to the convention <laughs> centers, because that's where, you know, they're not working anymore. A lot of times they're just hanging out at the bar. Uh, when people are drinking, they tend to be a little more uh, conversational, right? And they, the conversations tend to be a little more organic. Um, when it comes to meeting people face to face, like what are some of the, the tips that you have um, just for other networkers out there? I would say it's, it's easy to meet people when there's like a specific reason that people are meeting up. Uh, when I went to GDC for the first time, I did a ton of research in the free after parties <laughs> and like the various meetups. I'm like, okay, game audio meetups. I'm going to go to those because I'm allowed to go to them. I'm expected to go to them in a sense. And like, I can talk to anyone there and it'll be normal. And like, you know, that that's expected. Uh, there are some after parties and you meet people and the environment is different. Like some people are there to literally party and it's loud and it's hard. I like gone to after parties. And I talked to two people and I left and I'm like, wow, my ears hurt. And it's not that I don't like partying, but like it's different, you know, uh, my vibe. I, I, and I didn't learn this until later is, as you mentioned, like hanging out at a hotel bar and just talking to people. I'm mean, like, Hey, I recognize like a bunch of these people and they're talking to other people that I like maybe have seen before on the internet or whatever. Um, that's like a nice chill way to meet people and and or or just over meals where sometimes as um my friend chris says um he likes to katamari people where it'd be like hey we're all gonna get dinner and the people be like dinner i'm hungry and then you cool. just kind of like we're all rolling this way or moving this way and then you just get a clump of people and you all just get food together and, and you just meet people that way and i i love getting dinner with friends too so that's just something that i i particularly like as lot a lot as well um but yeah, if you want to meet a specific person, you can try and and talk to like make a appointment, I guess, to try and meet them somewhere. Um, if you're going to a conference and there are talks, you can talk to people like after the talk in line while you're waiting to like talk to the speaker or whatever. Um, I just I just find I used to find it hard to to just talk to strangers and I've gotten a ton of practice. Mm -hmm. But I think that at least with like your discipline like for me game audio meetups that one is like one of the easiest places to be like okay i'm like super nervous and i don't know anything or i don't know anyone but at least you know that everyone there is game audio and you can get to know people and usually if you keep going to game audio meetups you'll see a lot of the same familiar faces mm -hmm. again uh, and something that you touched on a little bit is being uncomfortable kind of getting to know people um i know there's a certain amount of kind of courage that you have to draw up in order to just have like be able to have a conversation with somebody um it, for me it was definitely a learned experience for me being an introvert um can you go over some of the like how were you able to come over overcome some of those roadblocks some of those mind um those limiting mindsets that you had before like how were you able to step out of that comfort zone i think the the very the scariest ones are always the beginning Going to a new thing for the first time is scary. My first ever meetup was terrifying. I got lost. Uh, I, I found parking somewhere far away. I got lost trying to get there. My GPS was not cooperating with me. <laughs> and I was cold and I showed up late and I was just like awkwardly like skulking into the room. Um, but once you're there and like the and, you know, the speakers then speaking and people just kind of mull about um, just try and either if, if you're brand new too, you can also do the research as to who organizes the meetups usually they're on meetup.com or eventbrite and you can see who's organizing them you can straight up just email the person or message them and be like hi i'm brand new i'm like pretty nervous and blah 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 but i'm excited to come and and if you find the organizer in real life you can be like hi like i message you over and as an organizer like oh my god organizing meetups is so much work and it's so much effort and it's like wow I love when new people show up and then they want every they want to do everything to keep the people keep coming. So then uh, as an organizer, if someone's like, hi, I'm new, I messaged you. I'd be like, oh, man, it's so great to meet you. And then I like would try and introduce them to other people and and just at least get them to meet a few other people. Um, 
just learn who they are, exchange business cards, come back again the next time or maybe two months later. You don't have to be there constantly, but it's 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 a process. And the hardest part of things is starting them or ending them. And in this case, there's never really an end to like networking. I'm, I'm never going to be like, I'm done mm -hmm. finishing projects. Now, that's another thing. But <laughs> it's uh, I, I just start small. Just talk to one or two people if you need to. And then you say hi to them the next time. And you talk to one or two new people the next time. And I and, did that every month. And so to follow up on that, um, so let's say someone's in college and they can't afford to go to every single conference or event. Like you mentioned, a Game Sound Con, there's GDC, there's, uh, I think you mentioned PAX. Which of those has been the most beneficial to you? And maybe that could mean lifelong friends or people that have had leads for work like if if there was like one thing that someone was going to be going to like what, what what would be the best start that's so the easiest answer i guess is your local monthly meetup um look up the igda you will probably have a branch in your area and so for boston because which is a pretty significant hub our branch is older than igda itself uh that's one of several meetups and so your local meetups are free there's sometimes they even have free food sometimes <laughs> don't expect it um and so those are pretty constant um and again to try and make a regular habit of going i remember there's some student friends of mine who went to a college that college closed down but before those students graduated, they were like super with it. I met them when they were freshmen and they were pretty regular at coming to meetups pretty consistently, mm -hmm. maybe every other month or so. Uh, and they got published and they had a game that got published. And I'm so proud of them. And <laughs> they were with it since like day one. And so like it's never too early to start. And yeah, it's a pain in the butt to get to. But also like, trust me, it's worth it. As well as like your school is also your network. Um, as for larger events... That's harder to say. Uh, also, sometimes if you're like in the middle of nowhere, just find the closest like regional online space. Mm -hmm. And there's usually, especially because of the pandemic, there's some online meetups. For larger events, uh, it's a little easier also since they're usually online now. Um, but me personally, GDC was because it's like a week long and I was and I'm my ridiculous self. I would spend such a high density of that time meeting people. And I guess... I don't know. It's it's hard to say. They're all different vibes. Like mm -hmm. I know that a, a a composer colleague of mine hated GDC, but loves Magfest because it's a oh, totally different I, vibe. Yeah, I love Magfest. I still have never been, and I really want to go. But it's every awesome. time, I'm just like I want to go to Magfest, and then I'm like, oh, it's rolled around again, and I'm my head wasn't in the place to figure out talks or submissions or whatever the heck, and how to get there and whatever the heck, and, and the next year. And eventually, eventually I'll go because I know I'll love it. And everyone says that I'll love it. But I just, it's just a matter of the logistics of getting there and and trying to figure out if I can do a talk for it. Because, oh, yeah, that's the thing. I don't like to pay for events. So I just try and speak everywhere, which is also doubles as a form of like promotion and showing people who I am and networking, I guess. But free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely love that hack that you just mentioned of being a speaker at a conference or some sort of organization. Um, how do you find your, your speaking engagements and how do you choose which opportunity uh, to actually speak at? Do you choose, do you, do you say, you know, anybody wants me to speak, I'm going to go, or is it, are you more selective in your uh, decision process? So this has changed a lot over time in the beginning. Oh my God. Everyone in the beginning, it feels like they don't have anything to add. They don't know what to say. Everyone already knows everything. They are no, um, they're not an expert enough to, to say anything. And therefore, like, they, they don't have, they're not qualified enough. And so my very first talk, I did a micro talk at Game Audio Boston, which I have later started to organize. And now I'm actually stepping down from for after a couple of years of doing it. But uh, my first micro talk was about, like, good ui sound or something like that and then my second talk ever was about like chip tune which i also don't do really um and so i just like gave it a shot and and again monthly organizers are constantly trying to find speakers so just go for it ah uh, you are already more of an expert 
than the people who don't do what you do. Like as a game audio person, I am more of a game audio expert than anyone that's not in game audio. And <laughs> that is that that's kind of like a, a form of breaking through imposter syndrome. After that, I started to try and do other events that weren't game audio and, and speak about things that I at least cared a lot about, even if I wasn't necessarily the most knowledgeable. But I'm like, here are things in other games that I've noticed in like how they have effects on stuff. And so I talked about Grant Kirkhope and how his his musical composition styles of changing in layers, that has been a huge influence on me personally, but also like the effects on that and how they kind of show the change in the world. And then I started to try and do bigger events. And like, let me see if I, oh God, I'm trying to think of what the first like large event I spoke at was. I think it was Boston Festival of Indie Games. Is there Boston Fig Talks and Learns? And so I did a talk about networking for students. And so because I started to like get to know things more. Um, and that started to evolve more and more. And then it got to the point where like, oh, people now need someone to speak on their panel. And I mm. love to talk and I network. And so therefore, a lot of people were like, hey, let's ask Chell. Or I sometimes just be like, hey, does anyone need a speaker for their panel about stuff? Because I like can know certain things. Um, that thankfully is a little bit easier for me and also um i i definitely can add some flavor to the diversity of some panels if that is necessary usually the panels that i'm, I'm on are actually already pretty diverse and of themselves mm -hmm. um and if you're if you're new and you feel like you're still not qualified you can run your own panel and be a moderator and get like three to five other people to like talk about a certain thing and and you can just ask them questions. And if you do all the heavy lifting, my God, the speakers will love you. All the panelists will love you. Oh, my goodness. It is like it's so much work to do a panel sometimes. And if you're a moderator, I, which I've done once, like, wow, <laughs> everyone will love you for doing uh, all the heavy lifting. Uh, I've now gotten to the point, um, and this is a pretty recent development where people have asked me and I've like been kind of like, hey, you want to do this talk? And be like, yeah, maybe. And I'm like, I'm putting your name down. I'm like, wow, okay. And then I did all this work and I don't necessarily know if it was worth it. And so I'm actually starting to slow down where I'm like, uh, do you pay your speakers? And if the answer is no and the work is more than it's worth, then I have to politely decline and be like, I'm sorry, at this moment, I'm not really able to take on non-paying speaking engagements or um Maybe it's for a larger conference and I plan on like going, but I definitely don't want to pay. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the conference's ticket costs is worth doing the talk. For me nowadays, it has become less so depending on the conference and, and whatnot. There are many factors, but now because I've done so much speaking over the course of several years, and I've done mentorships and even consulting, I am now allowed to be a little bit choosier with where and how I speak and how much time I put into things, especially if they pay me. Awesome. And like, it sounds like your evolution as a speaker um, has, you, you've taken great strides in that. And I'm curious, is this all stuff that you've learned on your own? Or did you have a mentor, like another professional speaker that's been guiding you during this, uh, during this process? Um, I mean, I have a mentor who taught me about all like the freelancing and business stuff. And then I've also kind of adapted a lot of that advice to my own. Um, but for speaking, I'm a rambler. I think it's clear from talking to y'all that you can recognize that I can run my mouth if I need to. Um, I have a lot of things to say. I think one thing that I've learned also just being on panels is trying to be cognizant of not taking up too much space. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I definitely used to do in like my past life of... <laughs> you know, just talking over other people. And so I'm, I'm trying to be more cognizant of that. And so I guess with speaking, no, there's never really been a mentor. If you want to, you can, you can definitely take some amount of practice into talking. I, for one, have not, you can probably tell because of my diction and rambling and butt ums and whatnots. Um, so I, I personally am have just always been myself and this is something for me but if if you're a lot more introverted or more, a lot quieter or whatnot it's definitely uh it can definitely be a lot more challenging so starting small with a micro talk or and then and then getting to a half hour talk uh full hour talks are exhausting oh my goodness uh, so yeah and then also podcasts because 
at least with podcasts, they're usually a lot less stressful than like I am going to a conference and presenting yeah. my expertise to all of my colleagues who are there and paid lots of money to see me. Ah, yeah. so <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I've I guess gone to. It's it's just constantly changing and growing and and I've formed a lot of opinions throughout my time. Awesome. And then another thing that you mentioned is that uh, just not only doing the, the podcast itself, but also going out and, and making videos. Um, can you talk about your journey? Like one of the things that really stuck out, stuck out to me is that you are looking, you're actively looking to help other people that want to get into the industry. Um, I, I'm guessing there's a backstory to that. Like, what made you actually venture out to creating your own channels and, and wanting to put things out there? So I guess like me wanting to help other people, I, I think that's just kind of who I am, but also the fact that I've been helped by a lot of great people and I know how hard it is. <laughs> I know how freaking hard it is. I've been on the beat for a long, not, I guess not that long, relatively speaking. It's like close to half a decade at this point, but like, it doesn't feel like that long, but I've been a high density, a very high density in that time. Uh, so I know how hard it can be. Uh, with making a YouTube channel, I don't really know when it started. I think I, I put some of my music on there. And then at some point, I wanted to make some videos because I thought it could be helpful and it could be a, a good way of, to promote myself. But also like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people have asked me about networking. And man, it's really convenient to just be able to send them a link to a video instead of saying the same things <laughs> every single time. Um, and so I, I, I figure out ways that I can help people because I have all this, I have a lot of ideas and, and things in my head. Uh, and then putting it into an organized video and then having several videos like how to break into the industry. And then like the next step of that. And, and I'm making a video now actually that's uh, I've been working on called how to promote yourself and how to teach people to do self-promotion and get in the headspace of doing that and and being able to talk about themselves in ways that they can brag about themselves without feeling like a slime ball. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my current project that I'm going to try and upload next week, I think. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, but it's just a thing. I wrote articles. I put it on my website. I don't know if anyone ever read any of them. Uh, that was my old website, and I've been writing new things for a newsletter and then i think at some point i'm going to try and import all of the newsletter articles that i wrote into like a article tab on my website and and have those there so that people can regularly access them uh but that's that's like a that's a later thing everything has always been step by step and it can feel it can be hard to acknowledge how long i've been doing certain things and how much trial and error I've gone through to get to where I am now um and it can feel like things are just magically going amazing but like there's a lot of trudging and there's a lot of stuff that I do that had very little interaction and there's a lot of things and you just keep doing it mm -hmm. and then you get better at it and then you try new things and you maybe throw out old stuff that didn't work as well and you just keep going and you do it because you'll want to do it I do these because I want to do them so that's why I keep doing them. And I think that they're good for other people too. And even if no one, I, I, I know that no one has, I, I know that more than zero people have seen this, but like, even if no one did it, I think it's still helpful and still knowledgeable. And because I know that more than zero people have been helped by what I do, I'm going to keep doing it because I want people to not suffer and, and burn out and get paid nothing and get, uh, scammed out of like really terrible contracts. Awesome. And I want to I want to touch on something that you said a little earlier is uh, promoting yourself. And so let me get this right. You it's not just about being good at what you do, but you mean you actually need other people to know that you exist. Um, <laughs> like what is what is self promotion exactly in your perspective? And like why why is that important? So I actually started out the video, um, not that I tell you, but I started out, but self-promotion is more than letting people know that you exist. It's convincing them that you are good at what you do <laughs> and also should they need your service that they want to hire you specifically. 
and I go into more nitty-gritty details about like how you can specifically promote yourself and how to make yourself stand out opposed to other people um as well as like ways it's um it's been I still need to do a lot of editing but I think that with I, I also think about myself and how I do it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, these videos are a form of self-promotion that I'm <laughs> making for you right now. And they help establish my expertise. And then I post it on the Internet. And then I share it again on the Internet. Um, so it's it's constantly trying to... None of, I'm never, like, saying anything too outlandish of, like, I'm never lying. I always say things that are factual. Like, I made this video about stuff. Or like here, here are like my thoughts on things, and uh, you know it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just do it because there's a very, very, very high chance that if you go, oh, I don't actually know that much. No, you're downplaying yourself, and you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. Mm. So own your dang achievements. Um, I started my introduction with I'm an award-winning composer. For a long time, I didn't say that because I didn't think my award was actually all that special. And then my friends bullied me into saying it. And now I bully my other friends because I'm like, hey, have any of you won an award? And like, yeah, I won a small one. I'm like, I don't give a crap. I'm like, <laughs> just, you're an award winning composer. Shut up. So wow. I will bully you into admitting that you are you have an award. <laughs> yeah, one. And the, another one of the things that I, I love about that example is that you've had people in your corner to help encourage you, especially when you had things like imposter syndrome, when you didn't want to promote yourself. Um, can you share the, you know, in your opinion, the importance of surrounding yourself with others that are um, that are in your corner, that are supporting you, that are guiding you through the process? Like, what's your experience with that? I, again, because I think that relationships are not transactional. Like, I just want to be friends with people. And I like to just make friends and connect with people. And, like, someone like Smash Bros, we're now friends. I don't care. I love <laughs> Smash Bros. Nice. You want to talk about Guilty Gear? We're really friends now. Um, with who, you like Guilty Gear? <laughs> so, with uh, with people though, I, you know, sometimes it can you can get jealous of people, but also at the same time, like I'm always legitimately really proud and happy of other people's accomplishments, and I, I try really hard to support other people. Um, and my friend said that, um, you know, when people are worried about like, oh, what if I come off as pretentious or whatever. And I asked them, like, do you think I'm pretentious? Um, and, like, when I self-promote myself, and they go, no. And then another friend is, like, she puts in a lot of effort to, like, help uplift other people and, like, just support other people. Because I'd like to think that I do. I have I've met some really, really fantastic people in my life. And I've helped try and foster uh, a local community and now a to an extent, an international one, as I have changed and things have gone in my life. And there are some people in my life who have not actually been so supportive. And I realized that, like, I wasn't necessarily happy to spend my time around them. And they weren't, like, they didn't necessarily respect the things that I know or did and said. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, gamers don't deserve rights. They, I tell them stuff about game dev and they just don't listen to me. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so <laughs> finding people to support you... Um, is really great and also having a having a community where everyone is learning and growing and pushing themselves it it helps you want to push yourself and then whenever people are like oh i have a new job interview wish me luck of course everyone's gonna be like oh, yep. you, gotta get, you got a job interview like, awesome. let's go let's go and then if they get the job then everyone like loses their shit and we all celebrate and we're all like yes let's fucking go gamer um so just put in Put in the work and join a community and find people who do what you do or at least are also trying to to get to a next level like you are. I was going to say aspiring, but screw aspiring. You're already a professional. <laughs> Just find other professionals who are trying to get better and improve and grow. And whenever people have something exciting in their lives, they share it. And I want you to share what is exciting about your life so that I can celebrate with you. And then we all get better and everything in life is great. Just do it. Man, that is... <sighs> Man, that's awesome. I really, really appreciate that that whole mindset. Um, and so we're actually nearing the end of the podcast. And so I ask everyone this, but do you have any parting words of advice that you'd love to give to um, specifically, let's just say, aspiring um, game audio um, people, you know, people from college studying composition, studying anything audio adjacent, and also um, 
feel free to share any of your links. Like I know you mentioned your YouTube channel, your LinkedIn, uh, anywhere that you have your portfolio online, go ahead and feel free to share those links with our audience as well. Uh, as for like my links, uh, I'm at Chelwang Audio on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can find me at ChelwangAudio.com. I also have links in my bio, which is Linktree slash Chelwang Audio. And there you can find literally everything. Uh, there are, if there are any other Chelwangs, I am, well, I'm the first one at Google. So <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be too hard to find if you want to find me. And I, I am very responsive to if you have any questions. Uh, as for parting advice, uh, first things first, destroy the word aspiring. You're not aspiring. You already are a professional. Just do it. And if you think that you aren't, well, telling people that you aren't isn't going to help you. Uh, so just acknowledge that you know more than you think you do. Uh, my personal life motto is to be the best that you can be and be the best that you can be to others. And so I am I, I in game audio. I mean, it's pretty ambitious to already want to try and do this already, but I'm I'm ambitious and I want to do cool, great things. And I think that I deserve to be happy and other people deserve to be happy. And I want to I want everyone to succeed. So if you ever feel like you're in doubt, there are people in your corner. Just talk to someone that you know and that you trust and you can get through it and know that being there for other people is I think the the most important thing in my life nowadays I used to think that I really treasured my time playing games but more than anything now I treasure my time with people and I have the people in my life while I have them now and I know that not everyone is going to be in my life forever and I know that all things are impermanent and so I embrace the things that make me really happy now and I will always be grateful for all the things in my past that made me happy. And I will always be looking forward to the things in the future that make me happy. And I hope that whatever is making you happy is what you do and who you surround yourself with. And that you keep pursuing the happiness and spreading it around. Awesome. That's that's great. I appreciate the whole thing. Thanks so much for agreeing to speak on the podcast. Um, and that concludes this episode of the Empower Up Podcast. Um, you guys can reach us on, you guys can actually watch this episode on Twitch. We keep it uploaded for about a week. And in a few weeks, we'll have this uploaded to uh, YouTube as well. So make sure you stay tuned on there. We're on YouTube at Empower a Podcast, as well as we're on all the podcasting platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, well, and as, as well as like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, we're basically everywhere. Um, so yeah. Um, if you guys uh, have the chance, make sure to follow us. And um, again, thanks for agreeing to come on. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.